Welcome to the Cerro Power Steam Museum, South Rockland's magnificent maritime museum. We're a five-star museum on TripAdvisor. Oh my God, we're terrific. And uh, we're so proud to be here in South Rockland, the finest maritime museum in the South End. My little wife, Meg, sitting here beside me. We started this museum 15 years ago. It doesn't seem possible now, 15 years ago. And it's been growing and growing ever since. So tonight we have a fantastic program for you and uh, we're pretty excited about it. Look at this incredible photograph. There's the old Bowden in the North Seas look at it, looking out through a cave in the iceberg. My God, isn't that magnificent? Imagine that little 88 foot schooner up there in those Arctic seas and the, not a day like this every day. This is a fantastic day, certainly. Uh, sometimes, of course, as you would well know, the weather gets pretty boisterous. What are you doing? This is, this is one for the books. Admiral Donald McMillan. Donald McMillan, there he is in, in his sealskin outfit. Yeah, yeah, an Arctic aficionado. He's got a polar bear cap on there and his dog beside him on the old schooner boat. Magnificent uh, uh, vessel the 26 voyages above the Arctic Circle. This man knows more about the Arctic than other men alive, I believe, uh, during his career back in the 1920s and 30s. Born in 1874, born in Provincetown. He uh, didn't get to, to the Arctic until he was 32 years old in 1908. He made his first trip to the north <clears throat> on a uh, expedition with uh, Robert Peary. Robert Peary, well, uh, McMillan was uh, in education, he graduated from Bowdoin College and uh, became a teacher. He had a, a group of young people that had set up a summer camp up in Casco Bay. And uh, one time he was there and one of his kids fell out of a boat and he was drowning. McMillan jumped in the water, ran out and saved this kid, pulled him out, pulled, dragged him ashore and resuscitated him. And Peary heard about this. Peary had an island. Robert Peary had an island out in Chasco Bay. He heard about this and he went to Donald McMillan. He said, would you like to join our expedition in uh, uh, 1908 and go north? We're going to go up to try and determine the, the absolute uh, center of the earth right at the very top of the world. And McMillan gave up the career of education and said, oh, yes, I'll, I'll go to, with you to the Arctic. So off they went. McMillan got up there and on the last outstation, he had frozen feet and he couldn't go out on the ice in order to plant the flag. Uh, so Henson and, and Peary went off and as they, as they left camp, they said, McMillan, uh, Mac, you take my rifle, take my rifle, 4570, and protect yourself from the polar bears that may come into the camp whenever they smell food, polar bears get hungry. So Mac said, okay, I'll take that. But that rifle now hangs in the museum, in the Bowdoin exhibit. So if you get to the world famous Sail Power Steam Museum, you can see that rifle there. Anyway, that's just one of the beginnings of the 26 voyages this man made on that incredible little schooner. Right now, though, we want to change gears and I want to do the commercial. Oh boy, look at this, this look at this beautiful building we have here. Last year we completed this. This is our new, newest building, most magnificent building uh, in the complex of the world famous Sail Power Steam Museum. We have had several different occasions, several different programs in there. One of them early in the summer, we had uh, Gabriel Donahue there, fantastic Irish music, uh, with several other functions. We had <coughs> fundraising functions, we have to do that too. And then we had Gordon Bach in the fall. 150 people we had in there for the Gordon Bach concert. Everybody knows and loves Gordon Bach. This is a little late in the fall, the last fall flower there. Over on the side is a, uh, our, our schooner, the gem, which is of course a front piece for the museum. People give us these boats. We have our big steamboat in this museum. And of course the boat, the uh, uh, light horseman that discovered Penobscot Bay in 1605. And uh, oh, a hair shop and a couple of beetle cats and so on. Antique boats in there. People give us boats, give us things all the time, give us boats. Uh, we got a boat from uh, uh, Captain Bob. Um, that gave us a morning in Maine. Bob Pratt gave us morning in Maine. She's a beautiful little peach colors uh, catch. 
And we use her now, she's been in the business quite a long time. We use her for two hour sales in <clears throat> Rockland Harbor, in and out of Rockland Harbor. Couple of lighthouses, beautiful thing. We have Captain Tyler Watterson. He's a very receptive, very charismatic captain and uh, uh, answers all the questions everybody has. Sign up for a two hour cruise this, this coming summer. You'll enjoy Penobscot Bay. What I want to tell you about is our SCIF program. SKFF, not SCIF, SKIF. This is uh, SKFF, Sail Kids for Free. We give kids from 8 to 14 years old a week-long sail training session for free. These kids, they, well, the first thing we do is take their telephone away from them. Get that telephone out, put it in a box, put it in, in a safe locker ashore. They have to get in a boat, one kid to a boat. These are little the six foot prams, they're called Optimus prams. And it's one kid to a boat and they have to grab the tiller and they have to grab the main sheet there and, and they have to learn to sail. There's no alternative. <clears throat> so we get them out there day two, we, we, get them, we get them organized and we get them out there and they jump in that boat and go out. And they, of course their mind is young and they soak up this stuff like a sponge. They learn how to sail that first day. The second day they're out there by themselves and sailing around out to the outer ends of the harbor, back again. Third day, they turn the boats over, they ran, uh, ride them up again, keep on going sailing. By the fourth day, they're out there, it's all competition. Of course, their buddies in the next boat to them. So they gotta go faster, they gotta outsail them one way or another. And that's what they do. By the fifth day, they are really professional sailors going out, racing each other around the buoys in an organized race. They come back in and they want to do it again, over again, but we can't do that. Of course, we've got to move on and we do move on. And this is the way we uh, substantiate what we're doing. We have to, of course, with insurance, with expenses for staff, we have to have people that are well-versed in sailing and well-versed in kids in order to take care of the people's children, take them out safely. But we have a little thing that we do here, a little scheme that we rigged up. For $100, most people can afford $100. For the sake of our kids here, for $100, we will match you. We will match you with another kid. So you get two kids for your $100. Send us 100 bucks and we'll put two kids out there. Send us 200, we'll put four kids out, 306, do the math all the way, $500. That's not too much. With this, this inflation the way it is to $500 isn't really too much to save our kids, to teach them all kinds of wonderful values of self-reliance and, and uh, teamwork and all the things that sailing will teach them. <clears throat> These kids get out there and they, they just, it changes their whole personality in just a week. It's amazing. Well, send us what you can. If you can't afford a hundred bucks, send us whatever you can. If you can afford a thousand, we'll put a whole class out there. A thousand dollars, we'll put, uh, we'll put, 20 kids out in boats, my God, it's just incredible. So we, can, we couldn't do it without you. Other things that we offer here, <clears throat> if you're a sailor and you don't have a boat to sail, just come and join our little club here. and We'll put you in a boat, an antique boat down in the lower left there, that's a Harishoff 12 and a half. And above it is a friendship sloop. If you're a qualified sailor, you can take a friendship sloop out. We do the maintenance, we do the care, we do the dockage, we do all the stuff, and you have the fun sailing. <clears throat> call, us, call us and see how we can work this thing out for you so we'll get you out on the water. We have two beetle cats, two friendship sloops, a whole parcel of, of uh, other cat boats, and these Optimus prams. If you're a young fellow who's been out sailing before, grab one of our Optimus prams and go for a sail. Own your skills. Our Sunday jam, another community service we do. On Sunday, we have a free and open jam. People come, we've been doing it now for almost 14 years. People come and bring their instruments. Usually, we have between 15 and 20 musicians, sometimes as many as 25 musicians we've had in there. And everybody's, oh, they play the old songs and everybody sings along with it. They play their own compositions. They do whatever they want. But everybody's welcome. They come in the door. They can stay an hour. They can stay for four hours. Most of them stay the whole time. We serve coffee and it's a great time. And sing the old songs. And you don't have to play an instrument. If you can clap and stamp your feet, you're more than welcome. 
if you want to have a <clears throat> larger celebration, rent our tent. We have a great big tent down there on the waterfront. We've got a fire pit down there where you can do marshmallows and hot dogs. We've got a tent that will take 150 people, bring, bring 150 friends over for lunch. And uh, by golly, they're, they're, put them under the tent there, or you can have a lobster dinner and so on and so forth. Well, that's enough of the commercial. Let's move on now. We're gonna move on to the next, <clears throat> the next one here, Admiral Donald McMillan. Admiral Donald McMillan, the Arctic aficionado. He's an amazing man. He's, a, <clears throat> he's a, done more than 250,000 miles in the old boat and pushed her around the Arctic. Some say 300,000 miles. Well, when you get over 250,000 miles, it really doesn't matter, does it? I mean, so it was 300,000 miles. He did 26 voyages above the Arctic Circle through uncharted, unknown regions on the old Bowden and never lost a man and never hurt anybody too seriously. A really amazing man. Now, of course, he went with with Robert Peary up to the North Pole. That was his first experience to the Arctic. The old Arctic bug bit him and bit him some hard. <clears throat> he had to get back to the Arctic. So in 1910, he joined a Crockerland expedition to the northern part of Greenland. The National Geographic put it together. <clears throat> he went on this expedition all the way up to the very northern Etah, above Etah, northern Greenland, the furthest north uh, settlement uh, in, in the world. And uh, went up there for a winter. A relief ship dropped him off and it was expecting to pick him up the next spring. He got up there, he went out on the Arctic ice cap, <clears throat> went all the way across the Arctic ice log, looked all over for what was reported as Crocker Land, these huge mountains up on the top of the world on, in the middle of the ice uh, uh, cap, and they never found a thing. Apparently, all of the reports that they had of Crocker Land were all a mirage, it was all a crock. They never, they never found it at all. So Macmillan came back, <clears throat> expecting to come back to the United States on the relief ship, but something happened. The relief ship didn't make it. Bad weather, bad conditions, they couldn't get him. He was there for another year. They tried to get up the next year to pick him up again. They couldn't make it again. They had other problems and they never got there. Oh my God, he was there for four years, four years living with the Inuit, living with the Eskimo, all the way up in the very northernmost part of Greenland. And he learned their culture and he learned their language and he learned their habits and he learned how to survive the winters up there and eat seal and, and walrus and all the rest of the things that the Inuit eat up there. And he really became you know, almost an Eskimo. He knew more about the Eskimo culture and, and so on than, than any other living person. He had a lot of time up there to think things over. And he decided, since nobody really knew too much about the Arctic, he would decide to have a vessel built for Arctic exploration. So he had designs from uh, a beautiful design of a little schooner that was built down in Booth Bay Harbor, down in uh, uh, oh, East Booth Bay, Hodgson Brothers. And 1921, they launched that wonderful little vessel called the Bowden. Uh, fantastic design, designed for Arctic use. It had a lot of dead rise, so that if it was nipped in the ice, if the ice crowded in around it on each side, it would pop up out of the ice. It wouldn't get crushed. Also, a big apron piece down below her stem, behind her stem, and boilerplate around the bow so that he could run into the ice cakes up there and go into very little small places. Only 88 feet long, this little vessel was. Magnificent little vessel, beautiful little thing. William Hand designed it and uh, just as pretty as a picture from every angle you could look at. They decided to head north, 1921. He got a bunch of people together, <clears throat> a bunch of ologists, zoologists, biologists, all kinds of ologists, and they went north way up at Hayden. Now, McMillan McMillan been up in this area before, and he knew where this little hole was, this little place called Refuge Harbor, way up above Utah, right over those headlands right there, is a, a polar ice cap that's unnavigable. Well, he went into this little thing in the summertime, this little harbor, and plopped his anchor down, 
and they waited for the fall to come and, and winter to come. And the vessel, of course, iced in. They built, packed up snow around there. 335 days they spent all through the dark night in this little harbor, built igloos on deck so that they had ventilation and, of course, a way to get in and out of the vessel. And also, polar bears, for some reason or other, they don't like igloos. So they, don't, they wouldn't come down on the vessel, although you're down there cooking breakfast. Well, by God, if you didn't have that igloo over the hatch, that polar bear would be right down next to you. 335 days they spent there all through the winter doing their research. And come spring, they had hoped to get out, of course, because uh, the ice was melting. They had a coal stove down below there. The ice was melting. Right around the vessel, there wasn't any anything but water right around the vessel. They had to get out. You could look out into Smith Sound out beyond the headland there, and it was all blue water, all beautiful. How could they get out? They couldn't get out because they were frozen in. Well, they decided they'd put coal on the ice in front of the vessel. That would draw the sun. It would weaken the ice, and they could work their way around to the shore, and then they could work their way around to the entrance to the harbor. Well, of course, they were banging on the rocks, and they had to go just at high tide, and when the tide fell down, the old vessel would fall over on its side and lay on its side until they could get the tide back up again, and they could get underway again, and finally, uh, they, they worked their way several days around suffering <clears throat> between tides all the time. Now, of course, the old vessel, she's, she's an arty Gorkhaus by now, so she's starting to show uh, her uh, experience in the Arctic, but still a magnificent vessel. Arctic without any charts, Arctic without any guides, without any way to know where the rocks are until you run on to them. She was running aground over and over and over again. How did the vessel survive? Just amazing the way that vessel survived. <clears throat> this is really, a, looks like a very extreme picture, but it, it's, well, it certainly is an extreme picture. If you want to know the story of how they did survive and how they got out from this refuge harbor when the whole place was covered with ice, go back and look at our captain's quarters. Uh, issue number three, the third captain's quarters is about the schooner boat, and it's a very detailed uh, history of the schooner boat, and it tells all about how she was trapped in the, this one particular cove and how they got her out, and tells about a lot of other experiences on the schooner boat. So that's uh, issue number three of captain's quarters. Well, finally, Miss Millen, after 26 voyages to the Arctic, uh, in 1954, he decided his last voyage, he's 80 years old now, he decided his last voyage to take a bunch of kids, and they would go up for a summer cruise all through the Arctic and come back again, up to Lab Labrador, Greenland, and uh, back again on his last trip. They decided what to do the, with the Bowdoin, they would give it to the uh, Mystic Seaport Museum. So they did. Mystic Seaport Museum <coughs> accepted the vessel but they apparently weren't terribly interested in it. Uh, she languished there for more than 10 years. They never did anything to help preserve her. The poor old thing, she started to suffer quite badly. Finally, a woman stepped through the foredeck with a rotted, rotted place in the foredeck. So they closed the boat and they stripped her. They took the mass out of it. They took the engine out of it. They took the windlass off. Every piece of hardware they could get off that vessel, they took off of it. Why? They were gonna sink her. McMillan so worried, so desecrated by this news, he decided he would do anything he could to find, find the vessel a new home. And he made it public that if he could find someone to take the Bowdoin, uh, he would find a new, new home for it. So I called him up and he gave me the boat. I took it north. We went to work on it. We, we put new foredeck on it. We put new planks in, in the side. We gussied her up. We put the rig back and, and make a new mainmast. did that. And in a year, we got her together enough so that we could go for a trip with her. I wanted to go down and salute McMillan. He's 95 years old now. I wanted to make sure we get there in time. So we gussied the boat up as best we could, put plywood patches over her, and got her seaworthy enough to make the trip. We decided to head out for this sentimental journey down to salute McMillan down in Provincetown, October 5th, 1969. We started out when first to Wiscasset because her first sail to the Arctic in 1921 was taken from Wiscasset. We started her new launching, the new launching of the new vessel, rebuilt 
from West Castle. We went down to Gloucester, we went down to Boston, and I had my crew from my, the adventure we sailed over the summer. And uh, this, this is Jan over here on the bow. She was my cook on the adventure. This is Spence Apollonio here behind the wheel. He's a fish commissioner for the state of Maine back in those days and a fantastic guy. Uh, off we went, we went uh, through, the, <laughs> through the fog. We went into Boston, we lay over in Boston making our departure from there to Macmillan's place in Provincetown. We got up the next morning, oh my God, dungeon thick of fog, we had no radar, we had no electronics, we had nothing but a compass and a lead line, the compass hadn't even been swung, but we had to go. So we went, everybody was expecting us over there, waiting for us over there. But we went out through the fog, and uh, ran our time out. Uh, we got the Lisbon out. He started this sound. We knew we were getting into shoal water over in B Town there. <clears throat> so he's shouting out, you know, 12 fathom, 10 fathom, uh, 8 fathom. <clears throat> Finally, he says, 3 fathom, Cap. I said, 3 fathom. We couldn't see a damn thing. I said, 3 fathom. We're drawing 10 and a half feet. That's 18 feet. So I said, Well, we've got to go to the dock now. We can't continue on. So I spun the wheel. We jived over, <clears throat> headed for the dock. And just at that time, Oh my God, it, it, it was God given. All of a sudden the fog cleared and we looked through this clear stretch all the way to the shore and there was McMillan's house. And there was Max standing on his porch ringing his bell. We couldn't believe it. We couldn't believe it. But there he was, he could hear our horn. He knew we were coming and he got his bell out to warn us, to tell us that we were getting pretty close. Oh my God, he saw the vessel sailing by. We went over and we tied up in P-Town. <clears throat> All these people came aboard. Mac came down and regaled us with a wonderful story north. He was so pleased to see his vessel sailing again. <clears throat> and there he is, <clears throat> sitting on his porch, looking out over the bay, and, and he was able to see us sail by. We had a wonderful visit, sentimental journey, and then we sailed back to Camden, we worked on the boat for the next two years. We gussied her all up. We put her in the windjammer business for four years. <clears throat> so had a wonderful time with the old schooner Bowden. And uh, we used to go sailing spring and fall after the season, just for fun. I've sailed her hundreds and well, over thousands of miles, various places from uh, the northern part of, of Cape Breton all the way down to the Chesapeake to Cape Charles. And finally, she went through some other vicissitudes and uh, she was, a, a, well, I'd say donated to Maine Maritime. She was made available to Maine Maritime Academy with Andy Chase and some of the other helpers there. <clears throat> By God, they got together and they made it possible to get the, uh, <clears throat> the Bowden. They bought her, they bought the Bowden with drug money. Yes, drug money, that's what I said. They bought the Bowden with drug money, but I'm not going to tell you about it. Andy Chase told me all about it, and it's all on that issue number three, the story of Captain's Quarters, the number three issue on the schooner Bowden. The details are there. If you want the details, look it up. Bought the Bowden with drug money. Now she's the pride of Maine Maritime Academy and the vessel of Maine, the maritime vessel of Maine. We're very proud of this schooner boat. So <clears throat> time to <clears throat> time to get on with our uh, lecture here. Now, if I can figure out what to do. This is real one Labrador, real two, we'll be having in two weeks. This is about three quarters of an hour long. So sit back, kick back. And remember, this is the 1920s. Back in these days, things were different. People survived on sealed well blubber and so on and so forth. Well, the boys, I'm afraid we lost that. The lights didn't go out in time. The boys are putting on the food. We may be gone one year, two years, we never know. Some years ago I said goodbye, I'll see you in two years. We heard nothing from us for four years. This is Donald McMillan speaking. His wife is bidding goodbye to her friends and we're just about to back out from the dock. If we could have the lights out in the balcony, they're both shining on the screen. <laughs> Thousands of people there, not necessary to tell you where this is. And the boats you'll recognize, 
And that year I went out for the Chicago Geographical Society. And Dr. Powers, professor of geology, is going with me on that particular trip. I've had many professors with me, an inspiration to the boys. I like to take them on trips. Now the Bowden, as was said, was built for the Hudson brothers over here in East Booth Bay. She's 21 inches thick, double timber, double plank, covered with Australian ironwood and steel plate fur. Said by the Navy to be one of the strongest wooden ships ever built. 88 feet long, 21 wide. Roll, of course she rolled. Every good ship rolls. And look out for a ship if she doesn't roll. A ship is built to roll, but she must roll easily. And the Bowden rolls easily. And who are the men and women on board? Fathers and mothers of the boy boys, yes. At one boy, nine years old one year. Millions of boys are throwing their summer away doing nothing. The boy doesn't want that. Give the boy a chance. A boy doesn't need a vacation. A boy needs a change. A change, that's right. You recognize these boats better than I can. And the boats are simply loaded to the rail. Down the harbor, one by one I hear them yell goodbye and good luck. And three long blasts. And then they turn back one by one toward your harbor. Until finally, there's only one boat left. And I shall always think it was some mother who came to me that morning, worried over her boy. I said, look, don't worry. We always come back, and we'll be back in September, right on the hour and the day that we said we're coming back. But that last boat remained with us until we were well out of the harbor. And then she turned, waved goodbye, and we found we were alone. Boats under sail and boats under power. And I was honored to have these boats go with me down the harbor and honored to have them wait for me in the fall to welcome me back. It was always good to get back and always good to go away. <laughs> Up into the Northland. The last boat leaves. And now we're alone. I said, boys, every <laughs> sailor loves to sail. And we'll stop that old engine and we'll give her the mainsail. Very rarely do we ever say, boys, Hoist the mainsail. And that is the mainsail. Give her the mainsail. Then give her the foresail. And you sailors here know between the two masts the foresail of the foresail. And we have enough oil in our tanks to go to Europe without hoisting the sail. But we want to sail. We're going to sail nearly every day for the next three months. And who are the boys on that particular trip? Oh, that's the son of the president of the great Monsanto Chemical Company. Oh, makes a good mate. Why not? He's interested in navigation. I'll make him mate. The next boy is interested in sextant reading. I'm going to make him second mate. That boy is from Yale University, interested in science. That boy from Dartmouth College, one of the very best I ever had, George Murphy. That boy is from the University of Chicago. And the next boy is from Princeton. Fine boy, football man. Played his accordion hour after hour. And you know, there were six more little boys who wanted to go. And they said their mothers told them, <laughs> yes, their mothers said that they could go. What ship ever had a better cook? A boy I picked up here on the street in Booth Bay. Clayton Hodgson, East Booth Bay. Grandmother taught him to cook. How that boy can cook turkey dinner every Sunday. Yes. And lemon pies. Oh, what?
Pies? What pies that boy can make? That's a real cook. Well, my wife is the best sailor. She ought to be. She's covered 90,000 miles. Loves the work. Comes from an old seafaring family. Her people came from Maine. Yeah, Addison, Maine. South Addison, Maine. Oh, she loves the work. Went into all the yacht races on the Massachusetts coast. Well, she ought to be the best sailor. I call her every morning at half past three. And she goes on the wheel at four o'clock. And at five o'clock she stands watch. Loves the work. And first thing to do, always in the morning, wash down your decks, keep your ship clean. And the doctor, that pleases the mothers to know I have a doctor. We've never needed him for all these years. They must learn to cut each other's hair. And Clayton Hodgson cuts Charlie Hildreth's hair, nephew of the governor of Maine. They're going to learn to do a lot of things, these boys. A lot of things. I said, look, you must sew, but your thread is too long. It's much too long. <laughs> no, mother isn't with them now. And they're going to learn to do a lot of things they never did in their life. Boys, good day. I want you to do your washing today. What year? Do your washing. You've never washed your clothes in your life. Your mother has done that. And these boys are going to wash out their underclothes. Stan Cook, Harvard graduate, and his roommate, Pete Rand, a Harvard graduate. Let your roommate help you wring out your red flannel underclothes. <laughs> Ring them out, that's right. Twist them up. And then we'll have an inspection when you're through. Hold them up. First washing the boys ever did in their life. Hold them up. And what about that towel you're trying to hide? I think you better do that again. Yes, on across the Gulf of Maine, George Murphy, why, a boy with a lot of money. Father, president of the Great American Lace Company. Never washed clothes in his life. <laughs> Boys, beneath that buoy off Cape Sable on Blonde Rock, the great full rig ship Staffordshire went to the bottom. A Cape Cod captain. And with her in the cabin, more than 200 men, women, and children. Captain made a mistake. A bad place, Cape Sable. Sambo, that's the last light ship, boys, off Halifax. And wave to those men. Oh, they're, li they're so lonesome, these men who live on the light ships, sometimes out of sight of land. And upon them, we depend for our lives, picking up light ships. It's a wonderful afternoon in June after I left Booth Bay Harbor. Southwest wind going to change this afternoon. Wife is on the deck <coughs> under the lee of the cabin house. And the side said, Miriam, the wind's going to change, and it's your watch for it. Stand by the fore rigging. We'll show the boys how to steer, and all our you men would like it. As Reggie Wilcox loves to sail. Yes. As many here love to sail. Down the Nova Scotia coast. And that night, a little bit tough. And in the morning, I said, boys, everybody up. I remember when I went to sea with my father, only six years old. He said, boy, I want you to see where I was born. And we're going into the beautiful Bradore Lake. What? The arm of gold? The lake's filled with Scotch people. The Macmillans and the Mackenzies and the Macdonalds and the McCritches. We're going into beautiful Bradore Lake. And get the everything down. It's shoal ground here. I remember that. Everywhere is shoal ground. Going into St. Peter. Boys, get your sails down and watch for a lighthouse on the starboard bow. I remember a little white lighthouse. And now it's hard to port, and we're in St. Peter's. 
the southern end of Cape Breton Island, in the basin. I'm in foreign country, and I must get a special permit from the Dominion of Canada to go through the lakes. And up on the port hand is a small building. I must report the name of the schooner, the tonnage of the schooner, where we're from, where we're bound to. And while I'm reporting at the little building, one of the boys came, said, Commander, I'd like to entertain the boys. Can you entertain, boy? Yes, sir. Let me take your fog horn. I'll play a tune on that horn. I'll dress up like a man from India, and I'll charm the snakes of Cape Britain Island. Can you charm snakes? Yes, sir. I can make them lie down. I'll scratch their back. I'll put them to sleep. All right, Peter, you entertain the boys while I'm in the building. Boys will be boys. What fun we've had during the last 30, 40 years. There's a boy on the right. There's a boy on the left. A string between them. <laughs> tied to the end of a piece of old rope. And they can make Peter's snake do anything at all. Commander, I, the boys are bothering me. I don't want my snake to do that. I said, Peter, you grab that old snake from the neck and come aboard. That's my main sheet, and I want it. <laughs> he said, just a minute. I said, no, not a minute. They're opening up the locks, Peter, and they're going to open up the bridge, and they're waiting for us. Come on aboard. So he grabs the snake from the neck, comes over the rail, a tricky bit of navigation, lighthouse, and do you know, common barn lantern hanging on a pole. Think of it. And there's a combination farmhouse and lighthouse. Oh, what a beautiful country. I wish you could all go to Bredore. Cattle grazing in the fields, sheep at the water's edge. Oh, it's a gorgeous place, right through the heart of the island. Beautiful Bradour Lake. And ahead of me, there's a bridge leading to Sydney. That is called the Narrows. And that bridge will be open. I know it will be. They watch for me every year. And way down on the horizon, there's a mountain. Oh, that's the home of one of the world's great scientists, Dr. Alexander Graham Bell, the man who invented the telephone. Now occupied by his son-in-law, Gilbert Grosvenor editor of the National Geographic magazine. Out into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, gorgeous morning, sun coming up out of the ocean, and we're headed for Newfoundland about 90 miles north. And tonight, boys, the barometer's right, thermometer's right, we ought to get a gorgeous sunset as the sun goes down over the hills of Labrador. Boys, why did we come? To learn something. All right, let's do it. And today we're going to start on the birds. Forty-four different kinds of birds. And you're going to know every one beyond the Arctic Circle before we get back. I know an island. Last year, the Canadian government counted 100,000 of these birds. And I want to know... I would like to know how many in my audience know what that bird is. Out in the West, not a person. And you see that bird only in the winter time, never in the summer. And that bird is the gannet. Out of the sky, like a flash, they strike the water. Millions and millions of these birds breeding in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. I wish you could all go. I want to go back again. Back to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. I said, boys, back in 1535, one of the great explorers of the world came here, and he went ashore on an island, and he found holes in the land. What made the holes? He didn't know. Put his hand in a hole and pulled out a funny bird, a bird that looked like a Paul parrot. 
Boys, I know where that island is. I wonder if the same kind of birds are living there today that lived there 400 years ago. Let's go. And we landed on the island on the southern Labrador coast. And one of the boys called within a few minutes, Commander, I said, what is it? I, can, I see a hole here in the ground. I said, that's the bird. For well, only one of the few birds in this world that did, dig a hole in the ground and put an egg one foot underground and only one white egg. So the boys called my attention to the one hole. I said, all right, boys, dig him out. And they began to pull him out. A bird that looks like a Paul parrot. That's a puffin, and that's right. And the little baby puffins, never been photographed. Only two days old. And when the boys dug them out of holes in the ground, the little baby puffins. The first lighthouse that we pick up on the Labrador coast is Point Amour. I thought it was the point of love. No, it's the point of death. And beyond that, there are some small islands. And my wife wants to go ashore on the island off Chateau. She came back and said, I found three eggs of the Ida duck. Right. And on the other side of the island, I found four eggs of the Ida duck. Right. And one nest, there was only one egg. I wonder what it was. She described it. I said, that's a gull's egg. And every gull lays two eggs. A gull's egg. And she said there were a lot of little chicks all over the island. What were they? Oh, I said, I don't know. There are four kinds of gulls up here. May have been the burgomaster, may have been the herring gull. Three. No, she said only one. I said, look, Miriam, every gull lays three eggs. Every gull must have three chicks. She said, that's right. Afterwards, I found them. They'll always, when they're frightened, they go back to where they were born. Just around the little nest from which they came out of the egg. And I think those are the young herring gulls. For the burgomaster goes into the far north. But in the winter time, this coming winter, if you see a gull in your harbor, no black on it at all. Oh, that's the burgomaster. Only comes in the winter. The herring gull is the gull I saw today in your harbor. The silverback gull, it's called. The Larus argentatus is a scientific name. But when I'm living with the Eskimos, the first bird I see in the spring, that white dot outlined against the blue sky, that's the burgomaster. And that's the first bird to come to us in the spring of the year. Not a bit afraid. They simply want to be fed. I put them in a bucket. I take them on board the Bowden. I feed them. I photograph them. I keep them. Feathers all come out. Then they fly away and leave me stay just as long as they want it. In that way, we learn the birds of the north. Forty-four different kinds beyond the Arctic Circle. Boy well, said, look, iceberg. Oh, no. That's a part of an iceberg. You never see icebergs in the Straits of Belle Isle. Why? They can't float. Bits of birds, yes. And you know the boys didn't know that all icebergs are freshwater ice. What? Oh, yes, boy. All freshwater ice. All icebergs and only parts of bergs here. Later on, we're going to see more than 5,000 icebergs. What? Oh, yes. More than that. You can't get away from icebergs from now on. They're everywhere. Battle Harbor. Oh, you remember the world's great missionary, Dr. Wilfred Grenfell began his work there in 1891. Battle Harbor, yes. Yeah. A great fishing place. The schooners that gather there on their way north, anchor there on their way home. And the men take their little boat and go out, drop a jig in the water, no bait. And the codfish gather around it, come back, dry the fish, sell them, pitch them up on the dock, as you see. Sell it to Bain Johnson and Company at Battle House. It's one of the great fishing places on the Labrador coast, Battle Harbor. 
but made more famous because Dr. Grenfell made, built his first hospital there on the Labrador <laughs> in 1891. There I met him 50 years ago at Battle Harbor. The tilt, they call, the stages. When I first went to Labrador 51 years ago, there were 1,400 schooners. What? Yep. From Newfoundland, my father went there fishing. They went from the States up there. And now there's not a dozen. They're nearly all gone. The boy said, look. I said, yes. Yeah. That's a fishing schooner from Newfoundland. Where is she going? To her fishing station. And then they're going to put out traps. And they're going to fill that schooner right to the hatches. And be back home in September. Follow them along the coast to their fishing station. And what's that one? That's a salt schooner. She's been to Labrador. She's landed her salt. She's going home. She'll be back in a couple of weeks. And how do those, did those schooners catch codfish? Hook and line? Oh, no. They make a room like this out of twine. They put a bottom in it. They cut a door in the side. And when the fish come swimming along close to the rocks, they go through the door into the room. And when the room is full of fish, shut the door. Got a room full of fish. Take your dip net and dip them out. What? Oh, yes. Just dip them out with dip net into your boat. And you that like to go fishing, look, look. Up there at the bow of the boat, there's a man actually grabbing those fish by the tail and pulling them in over the rail. Now, that's not a sporty way to catch cod. And when that boat is completely filled, as it is now, back to the mothership, where the fish are cleaned, put down the hole, buried in salt, carried to Newfoundland, put out in the sun, and dried, and away they go to the Mediterranean, to Italy, France, Portugal, Spain, yes, on to the West Indies. That's what they do in Labrador. That's what they've been doing for hundreds of years, catching codfish. Coming in from the Grand Banks, the coast is swarming with cod. An industry now that's almost dead. What else do they do in Labrador? Well, boys, I'm going to take you into Hawks Harbor. I haven't been in for 20 years. And no sooner than I rounded the big high bluff at Hawks Harbor, the boy said, what's that? I said, that's a whaling station. We had one like it in my town of Provincetown. We call it a whaling factory. Catch whales? Not as we used to. In the olden days, we harpooned whales out of whale boats. Today, they shoot whales. Steamers out of the ocean. And on the bow of each steamer, there's a gun weighing 200 pounds. And that steamer is in constant communication with a little building up there on the side of the mountain. And you'll see it in just a minute. A red building, a wireless station. And the day that we entered, they received a radiogram from a steamer out off the coast of Labrador. Well, there are 16 different kinds of whales up there. And the radiogram said, we've killed a big blue whale. I said, boy, anchor. I want you to see the biggest living thing that God ever made. What? Bigger than the dinosaurs? Oh, my. A dinosaur weighed only 40 tons. You're going to see the, the biggest living thing in the world, a blue whale that weighs 100 tons. A whale averages one ton to the foot. A blue whale. 
And if it's 125 feet long, it weighs 125 tons. Now roll him over, and boys, look at the two. Mouth. A dozen men can stand in his mouth. You can row a 21-foot boat right into his mouth. What? Yeah. And the next morning, and a steamer comes in, another whale. Oh, I said, boy, that's the finback. That's the whale I see from my study window. That's the whale comes into Provincetown Harbor. That's the whale three days ago. Came around the back beach of Provincetown. The water was filled with these finback whales last week. Not a big whale, only about 65 feet long. And while we're pulling out the finback whale, may I say that's not the kind of a whale that swallowed Jonah. Read your Bible tonight. What will you read? God created a great fish, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Whale's not a fish. A whale is a warm-blooded mammal like you are. It has blood like your blood. It must come up to breathe. And you know, never went into the water. What? Went around through the trees and through the grass and over the hills. How do I know? Take your knife, cut right in there where those three men are standing. you find the two hind legs right under the flesh. Hind leg. He had four legs. They dwindled away. Finally, so large he couldn't walk, and the flotation power of the water, he had to go into the water, and the legs have disappeared. The finback whale. That whale can't swallow anything larger than an orange. Really right. A sperm whale can swallow a man, and has swallowed men. In fact, it swallowed a 17-year-old boy, and the boy lived for 18 years after that. <laughs> really, right? His grave is outside of London. Now, boys will do anything. What do you think the boy did? He got inside the head, and he wiggled the eye, and three boys walked by. And you can imagine what those boys thought when they saw that eye wiggle. <laughs> That liver will weigh 2,000 pounds. What? Yep. And what a great big heart. The heart will weigh 1,000 pounds. What does your heart weigh? 11 ounces. The heart, 1,000 pounds, right. The tongue, oh, you wouldn't believe that. That tongue weighs between two and 6,000 pounds. The tongue alone. Eleven feet long, seven feet thick. Think of it. Let's peel the whale. Don't skin him. Let's peel him. Just like you peel a banana. Put a hook in around the neck. Pull back the lever on your steam wedge. And we'll rip the whole side right off of it. Really rip it right off. Solid blubber. Eight, nine inches thick. Mm -hmm. And off of that whale, we'll get 60 barrels of oil. What are you going to do with it? Well, we'll make soap. We'll make oleomargarine. We'll make cosmetics. We'll make many things. And you women will be interested. The very best of that whale oil will be used in making ladies' lipstick. And when you men kiss your wives, you get a whale of a kiss. Now, <laughs> turn, turn the whale over and rip off the other side. Peel him like you peel a banana. Solid blubber. Eight, nine, ten inches thick. And that's the fin back, right? Not as much blubber as on the sulfur bottom whale. Take off the other side. And we'll follow the blubber up the ramp. With my camera, I'll follow it up the ramp. And on the top of the building, it's flat roof. There'll be holes. And they'll cut it up into squares drag it along, drop it down through the hole into the steam vat. And the fire's going for three months. Well, let's follow the blubber up the ramp and see what they're going to do with it. <coughs> and a blanket, we call it a blanket, a blanket of blubber, goes on up the slippery rank. Then I'll watch them cut it into squares. And with eye on the hooks, they'll drag it along and drop it down through holes. How many whales did they kill that year? 
413 whales. <laughs> and every whale worth $5,000. Why? Every part of the whale is used. When I was a boy, we had a whaling factory like that at my home. And we'd simply kept the blubber and threw away the body. And they drifted all around the house. The head, oh, they're going to save the head. And that head will weigh three tons and a half. What if three tons and a half? And up goes the big head. To be cut into sections, pulverized, dried, put in canvas bags, out it goes, bone meal and fertilizer. And the body, oh, they ate a million pounds of whale meat in Norway last winter. <laughs> Let's cut off 30, 40 tons of delicious tenderloin steak. Oh, my boys like whale steak. Right off the backbone. Especially good on the thin back whale. Not very good on the blue whale. <laughs> and that leaves the backbone. Will you believe me when I tell you that that backbone will weigh 21,000 pounds? Yeah, 21,000. And up it goes under the steam saw. To be cut into sections, pulverized, dried, and put in canvas bags. And that whale has no teeth? Oh, no. Sperm whale has teeth. About 40. Not that whale. Hanging from the upper jaw like the leaves of a book. Whale bone. Baleen, we called it. That's a strainer. It blows the water in between the leaves and swallows the little fish. Cut it all out. Look right into the great big jaw bones of a whale. Stand it up on end. Oh, you can drive your automobile through the jaw bones of a whale. And when he opens that big mouth into a school of small fish like this, with every gulp he'll take in two, three barrels of fish. So much for the finback. Out we go into the icebergs off the Labrador coast, just as far as we can see, iceberg beyond iceberg. And if an iceberg is 200, up she goes. Camera is on my tripod now. We're rolling just a bit. Watch that wave break on that berg. Isn't that gorgeous? Yes, just as far as we can see, iceberg beyond iceberg. <coughs> we couldn't count the bergs. We never can count them. But I can safely say we see at least 5,000 every year. And from now on, always icebergs will be in sight. You've heard of Dr. Grenfell. How many of you have heard of the Moravian missionaries? Anyone in the room? Only a few. Let me tell you something. Dr. Grenfell came to Labrador in 1891. The Moravian missionaries came here in 1771. If it were not for the Moravian missionaries, there wouldn't be an Eskimo living in Labrador tonight. They held out their hands and said, we are your friends. No white man ever said that. <laughs> Since then, that time, life has been safe. And they brought their tools with them. They put up their mission house on the left. They built that church on the right. And they brought the Eskimo out of their holes in the ground. Really, they were living in holes in the ground. The igloos. And they brought them up. And they cut down trees, and they sawed out boards, and today every Eskimo on the Labrador coast has a little wooden house. It's a modest house, but they all live in wooden houses on the Labrador coast, which you'll see in just a minute. And that is Hope Day. Yes, in about 1770, I would say. 1771, or about 1780. And I am looking for my, I lived up here a year in Labrador, and the man who traveled with me, named Bartholomew, he looks like a Chinaman. All Eskimos do look like Chinamen. They're Mongol. They came from Asia. They came across the Bering Strait some 20,000 years ago. 
And to the wife, what would you like this year? First, I'd like a nice, big, strong black cigar. For we, every year, we carry, my wife carries presents to these Eskimo women. And I carry presents to the men. So I know them all now. I lived with them for a year. What is your idea of an Eskimo girl? That's a full-blooded Eskimo girl. And I knew her father and mother before she was born. What? Yeah. Now, some of them look Chinese. Now, you'll say, oh, yes, they do. They look Chinese. The next girl, you'll say, oh, she's decidedly Chinese. Mongo came from Asia. Very few full-bodied Eskimos on the Labrador coast today. They're a mixture of everything. Have you heard that expression, red in the morning, sailors take warning? Nothing to it at all. Change it to this. Blood red in the morning. Ah, only twice in my life have I ever seen that. Blood red in the morning. Look out, look out. I got into trouble once before. Am I going out? Yeah, why not? I got a good ship, good engine, I'm going. Sorry I did. A Newfoundland captain kept watching me. And when I got underway, he followed me. He's too small to go out in rough weather. And he never came back. He was lost that night with all hands. Did you know that on the Labrador coast, we have one of the primitive people of the world... Not the Eskimo, the Nascopi Indian. I lived with them way back in 1911. I found them starving in 1926, sent my dog teams into the woods and brought them out. The Nascopi Indian, driven north in a terrible war many years ago, they never dared to go back home. Poor, degraded, half-starved, poorly clothed, dying of the diseases of civilization. Why? Because no one cares. What? No one cares for the poor Indian. And through the years, I've watched them die. I built a home up there in 1946, and I had them come and live with me that winter, many of them. Dying of the diseases of civilization, and no one cares. And the last time I saw them, they were laughing. What's happened? They've been under the care of Newfoundland. Now Canada has taken all of Newfoundland, has taken all of the Labrador coast, and Canada will not let her Indian starve. And there's hope for the Nascopi Indians. I like them. Oh, name. Well, that's the biggest village in Labrador. That's where the Moravians held out their hands. Name taken from the Bible. A Moravian village, Eskimo village. Every Eskimo has his wooden house. And the brass band is coming. Oh, how they love music. The Eskimo brass band. Taught to them by the Moravians. Coming out to welcome me back to Maine. Why? I became interested in the Moravians. Dr. Hattash, Mrs. Hattash, I made a rash promise. For the rest of my life, I would feed and clothe 70 little Eskimo children. And Dr. Hattash and his wife gave me that daughter on the left. She's been my teacher now for 20 years. And the girl from Holland on the right. And my wife's so happy, clothing the boys in name and in hope days and in Hebrew. How they loved the chewing gum. Here yeah, they never had chewing gum. And we're taking up many things for our boys and girls. At the school, there in Nate, I have four buildings now. Go with me through the woods. My book, here yeah, I have 2,000 books on the one subject, Arctic. Those books tell me not a tree in Labrador. Think of it. <coughs> How the children love to go to school. I want to see my boy. Sears Roebuck and Company, 36 cents apiece. <laughs> and my wife wants to see the girls. I said, Miriam, 
unpack a box. I promised a boy last year a red balloon. I don't think the boy has ever seen a red balloon. And what fun that boy had. On to Hebron, the most northern Moravian station in the world. Hebron and the old mission house. About 1780, it's still there. And now, not a man, woman, and child there. <coughs> the whole thing has been given up in Hebron. But they're nearly all full-blooded there in Hebron. We've gone beyond civilization. Black hair, black eyes, high cheekbones, real Eskimo boy. What do they do in the summer? Help their father pick trout out of nets. Trout? Trout living under the ice in the winter time in the lakes. And in the spring, down the rivers, out into the ocean. Trout weighing 10 and 15 pounds. But the salmon going up to 40 pounds. Think of it. Salmon and trout. Yes. And as we go north, mountains up out of the sea, 6,000 feet high at the White Handkerchief. And on to Baffin's land. And I never can forget the cry that went up from the Eskimos of Baffin's land. I told them we were coming back. Yes. Living in thin canvas tents and in the winter time in rock igloos underground. As all Eskimo women, baby on her back. Girls marrying 15, 16 years old. We like the Eskimos of Baffin land. We find them so sociable, we're glad to have them come aboard the ship. And you know, to me, there's nothing quite as cute in this world as a little Eskimo girl. And from the little girls, I learn the Eskimo language. So I published a dictionary for the United States government. The older people talk with long, long words, but the children are so simple in their language. I like to have them come aboard and try to talk. To them. I said, Miriam, that boy wants chewing gum. I promised him gum last year. And on we go to ponds and lit. As you know, my father went north and never came back, lost with all hands. Are your eyes good? Up at the top of the screen. RCMP, Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Oh, Canada taking care of our Eskimo. I'm going to stay aboard the ship. The wind may come northwest. It's in the bad harbor at Ponds Inlet. White will go ashore to get the picture. He came back with a picture of the Hudson Bay Company's post, the oldest company in the world, by the way. And then she photographed the village of Ponds Inlet from the hill. And then I, above her head, I could see outlined against the sky the figure of Christ on the cross. She came back and I said, look, they must be Catholic. She said, yes, two of the finest men I ever met. A missionary from Italy and one from France. And to my question, when are you going home? They looked at each other and said, we are never going home. They're going to give their lives to the Eskimos of Baton. You know one of the sights of my life? Look, a pinnacle of rock, 800 feet high, rising out of the ocean, right at the Arctic Circle. I wish they had time to talk about that. The boy said, look. I said, what? He said, look at the white spot. I said, yeah, that's a polar bear. Boy, don't you... I'll take the rifles in my cabin. Never kill anything. It isn't fun to kill anything. I want to get the one picture that's never been taken. What's that? Picture of a polar bear swimming underwater. Oh, I have thousands of feet on top of it. But no one has ever photographed a polar bear underwater. And they'll swim for a hundred yards underwater. And you got a seal right in their mouth lying on the edge of a pen. Come on, Mr. Polar Bear. I know and I can see what you're doing. You're swimming with all four legs on top of the water. But I want to know what to do underwater. And notice, four legs on top. And when he swims under water, he'll swim only two. 
right paw and left hind leg. You know this. And you tell me why. Four legs on top and only two legs underneath. <laughs> I wonder why. And you may guess I'd like to learn from you. Come on, Mr. Pulligan. I wonder if four legs force him to the surface. Great big paws. Mr. Bear, I want you to come back, <laughs> and if you do, I'm going to let you go. I had a pet polar bear one day, and I had him for five months. My little bear followed me everywhere. And I want to talk with you. Come on back now, right up close, and I want to whisper to you. No, no, no. Come right up close. Right up close. No, I can't whisper. I want to whisper, I hope no man will ever find you, hope no man will ever shoot you. Come on right up close to me, and I'll pat you right on the head. And then we let you go. You do that? No? That's right. Come on back, right up close. That's good. What fun to watch him swim away until his head disappeared among those little white spots of ice. If you'll be patient for about five minutes, We'll put in the next big reel, and then we'll go way up to the top of the world. There. Are we on Captain's Quarters now? Robert? We are. We are. Okay. Thank you all for listening. What did you think of that? What did you think of that presentation? McMillan is an amazing speaker, is he not? Wonderful. Anyway, we've got an equal uh, amount of footage on the second. Uh, opportunity here, Reel 2 of the Far North, and uh, we'll be showing that January 30th. So I hope you'll be back for the continuation of uh, Donald McMillan's Adventures in the Far North. Uh, and I, also... I'd love, if I can just point out, you'll have to register again and, and get a new link for the new, um, the new show, the new um, Captain's Quarters, and I will put that link up tomorrow afternoon. Um, so you'll be able to do it. And also for those, somebody just asked if this recording will be available. We've been recording it. And so hopefully by Monday, we've got several meetings this week. So it may be Monday or over the weekend before I get it up. But the links are always on our music and calendar page and on uh, sailpowerandsteammuseum.org and on our YouTube channel. So you can always, always catch it again. And after January 30th presentation, Reel 2, we have February 13th, The Last Schoonerman, the story of Lou Kennedy, who uh, was one of the last real cargo carrying uh, sea captains. Uh, exciting life, really quite, quite amazing life. And uh, <clears throat> Patsy Bowling, uh, his daughter, will, she's also a licensed captain. Uh, she'll be telling me the story of Lou Kennedy. So stand by there. Uh, if you want a great, mo a great uh, book to read, why, uh, you know, these cold nights in Maine when the temperature's down to zero and you got the fire crackling there, why, there's a great book you can snuggle up on the couch and read. My memoirs, 40 years of voyage, and some of it's even true. And remember, uh, if, if you want to take one of these books home, why, you know, a free book for a little donation to the museum. Uh, $100 puts two kids in a boat. So don't forget, donate now as much as you can. We surely do appreciate it and we need it to your help to keep these kids away from their telephones and keep them sailing. So uh, they're sharing, sharing the screen. That's it. If you have any comments, why unmute and any questions you have, we'll try and answer them. Uh, go ahead and unmute and join in.